chatty student. <laughs> All right, so before we begin tonight, um, I would like to acknowledge today that we honor the indigenous people whose traditional ancestral homes we stand on, the Multnomah, the Kalanesh, Cal the Clackamas, the Tumwater, the Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors of the place and to recognize that we're here because of their sacrifi the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, their descendants, their past, present, and future. So before I announce the lecturer, I'd like to invite everyone to the Halley Ford Graduate Studies Graduate Symposium on Art, Design, and Environmental Justice that's happening this weekend, Friday and Saturday. So come and join us for that. We've got some really great speakers, a, a couple workshops that are happening on Friday for with some students. Um, it will be a, a weekend of learning and uh, enjoying, so come on by. So tonight's lecture is uh, part of the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies lecture series and is supported by two graduate programs here at PNCA, the MFA in Applied Craft and Design, which I'm program head of, and then the MFA in Visual Studies, um, who is uh, chair is M MK Guth. So our lecturer tonight is Josh Fox. Josh's practice combines textiles, pop culture, pop cultural detritus, and archival materials to address the relationship between language, community, and constructions of identity. His solo, solo museum exhibitions include the Neptune Society, um, Columbarium as part of the SF MoMA SECA uh, Arts Award Exhibition, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, and Lisa Cooley Gallery in New York. His work has appeared in numerous group, na group um, national and international I exhibitions, including the New Museum, New York, Sadie Cole's Headquarters, London, the Satachi Gallery, and the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston, to name a few. Josh is the recipient of the 2011 Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Grant, the 2012 SF MoMA Ardadia Awards, um, and his work has appeared in numerous publications, including Art Forum, The New York Times, Art in America, and the recent anthology, Vitamin T. Josh, Josh is also associate professor, professor and chair of textiles at the California College of Arts in San Francisco and Oakland. We're excited to welcome jo uh, Josh for this evening's le lecture on his work. Please help me in uh, welcoming Josh to PNCA. Oh, my, my water stool has arrived. <laughs> <coughs> I'm gonna just get cozy here. Yeah, maybe the other side. I'm like left-handed. <laughs> um, good evening. Thanks so much, MK and Sarah, and all the students that I've had the opportunity and pleasure to meet with um, during this visit. It's really an honor to be here. So um, today, I thought I would just share some of the work that I've produced over the past ten years work that triangulates between three different histories, um, the history of textiles, a social and political history, and my own personal history. In virtually all of my work, these historical coordinates are conflated, collaged, and redrawn to different conceptual and cosmetic ends. However, before I get uh, too far ahead of myself, I thought I'd begin by sharing a bit of personal history first. So I'm originally from the suburbs of St. Louis. Uh, specifically, I'm from a suburb called Crive Cor. In French, it translates to broken heart, um, an area where people predicate their quote unquote normal domestic existence on the latest Dateline NBC stories, Lifetime made for TV, movies, and or updates on the online sexual predator database. So to this day, my neighbors suspect that my parents are pumping toxic chemicals into the backyard, and my mom is convinced that she's living next door to a meth lab. Um, but whenever I um, attempt to describe my family's eccentricities, I always come back to this image above. It's a photograph taken of my mom's dining room credenza. And like any credenza, there are a number of drawers that pull out, drawers that would hold fine china, silverware, or glass. However, my mom uses the credenza to hide junk food from my stepfather, which you see here. 
Um, and then my stepfather uses the drawer on the opposite side, not photographed here, to hide his weed supply from my mom. So um, both are kind of hidden in plain sight from each other. Um, so since my growing up in the Midwest, I've moved around a bunch. After attending college in Ohio, I moved to New York in 2001, where I worked at Nest Magazine, which is a now defunct shelter magazine of interiors. Um, so the short experience of working with Nest really was one of the first lightning bulb moments that led me to the field of textiles, because it was this place where decoration and taste were always at odds with each other. One minute I was looking at old William Morris wallpaper, and the next minute I was taking pictures of at Amy Sedaris's medicine cabinets. So while working at Nest, I was also becoming obsessed with the Chelsea flea market, where I would rummage through these old craft and decoration magazines from the early 1970s, old uh, Better Homes and Gardens, or books with titles like these, Crocheting for the Home. So aside from gaining a wealth of technical knowledge, looking through these pages of the early DIY craft pamphlets, I began to think about how these domestic spaces were being conceived, or how these objects and ornaments were starting to give off their own psychological resonance. So let's just take a moment to look at this image. This woman is gazing longingly into the distance while posed on a crocheted ball that she no doubt lovingly crocheted herself. Um, the process of looking through these pages also led me to reminisce on my summer camp experiences. So for me, summer camp was a particularly interesting space because by its nature, it was this place where I could learn how to weave or knot or knit, but it was also this quintessential coming of age space. So in the broadest of definitions, it was a transitional space or an in-between space, or maybe it was even the first queer space that I really understood. So concurrent with my obsession with home decorating, I was also getting inspired by a lot of early fiber work produced in the 1960s and 70s, particularly, particularly around places like Cranbrook or the Bay Area. And the artists that emerged from this particular time and place used textiles as a political platform, as a way of inserting political urgency into a previously marginal history of process. But on a formal level, I was looking at these pieces as kind of visually sort of crazy. Um, and I was thinking about the expressive potential that lurked within them, yarn and masses of otherwise ornamental material oozing and spilling onto the floor, like the piece that you see here on the left by Peter and Ritzy Jacoby from 1970 called Environment Variable 2. And as reverent of, of the piece as I am, I can't help but think that it looks like a giant cat condo. Um, on the right, we see the more discreet ways that Ed Rosbach brought together a disparate array of materials in his Christmas basket as a way of displacing narratives between process, history, and metaphor. Similar to the ways that I was reacting to the psychological charge of the interiors from mac macrame manuals, I was also seeing a similarly maniacal impulse being projected onto these wall hangings. It was as if these pieces of decorations were somehow surrogates for this restless spirit, inherent in the way that, I s uh, that we create domestic space, a spirit that I see present in this piece uh, by Walter Nottingham on the right entitled Yarn and Mirrors. And as I was thinking about other kinds of disruptions within this stereotypical notion of domestic bliss, I was also watching way too much Lifetime movies. Generally, I like the ones with Meredith Baxter Burney. Um, there's always like a child predator lurking on the internet. I'm sure you've all seen Lifetime movies. Um, so the proliferation of these shows for me really became the embodiment of a form of domestic hysteria. So the domestic is a space that gets talked about a lot in fiber work, past and present. Um, and it's a space that I spend a lot of time thinking about and defining and redefining over and over again. So at the time, the domestic represented another kind of in-between or liminal site, a site of sterility with the always present anxiety that things would move be, uh, toward a darker place or move beyond our realm of control. So after a failed stint in textile design and fashion world, I left New York and moved to Chicago to, to attend graduate school and then ultimately moved to Eugene, Oregon to pursue a teaching job at the University of Oregon. So this experience was pivotal in the ways that led me to redefine notions of fiber history, social history, and domesticity as they relate to my work. So as a way of articulating this experience of moving to Eugene, I always show these stills from Todd Haynes' film Safe, um, which begins with Julianne Moore's character, Carol White, discovering that the new couch for her suburban San Fernando Valley abode, which she'd ordered in teal, has mistakenly arrived in black. So as a result of the snafu, Carol develops a completely toxic relationship to the sofa, and it's as though she kind of stumbles into a corpse in the middle of her own living room. So this event serves as a catalyst to Carol's forced isolation from society and her subsequent retreat into a community known as Renwood. 
So I know that a lot of my like some Eugene friends are here, and this is going to sound a little bit harsh, but Eugene in many ways functions similarly to Renwood. It's this town predicated by New Age grocery stores, bulletin boards festooned with self-help flyers, and it's an effort to completely disconnect from the rest of culture, at least it was when I lived there. Um, but it's also one of the few places in the country where you can take private lessons in tablet weaving or spend the week dyeing in cloth in the woods at an event called Fiber in the Forest. So I became fascinated by the ways that one could fashion identity through these processes in spaces of isolation. So with all this backstory in mind, the first piece that I'm going to show you after living in Eugene for a month or two, I entitled Endless Night. So Endless Night consists of a series of crocheted afghans supported by these precarious wooden trellis garden armatures. Each composition that I've crocheted is an, af an, is abs is an abstraction appropriated from a needlework pattern, um, and it reflects the view of the night sky framed by this domestically iconic architecture of the window frame and the curtain. Each panel that you see here is dipped in a shade of indigo dye successively darker than its adjacent neighbor. And in the corner resides a fourth and failed iteration of the three vignettes, a bundled assemblage of fabric and wood bound by an embroidered ribbon that reads, not your bag, over and over and over again. So the title of this piece was borrowed from an Agatha Christie novel of the same name, and it refers to a line of in a poem by William Blake entitled Auguries of Innocence. And in it, he writes, some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. So the lines of the poem really echoed this ongoing interest I had in, in using the vernacular of craft and its histories to recontextualize and psychologize the use of ornamentation within the domestic space. Um, and, I, and I think many of you are probably familiar with the process of indigo, but I think there's something kind of alchemical and magical, kind of witchy actually, about indigo in and of itself, because it's this dye that starts as this kind of, um, you introduce a fabric into it, and when you pull it out, it starts off looking kind of like piss yellow green, and then over the, the kind of um, scope of like 30 seconds, it turns to blue. And the more times that you dip the cloth in indigo, the darker that it gets. So I really thought about this idea of what it meant to drown something in sadness or drown something in indigo as a kind of, um, a, as a kind of performance almost. So throughout my practice, I've continued using the trellis structure, and at the time, I was really trying to figure out a way to move between this extremely labor-intensive process from endless night and a kind of immediacy that I connected to something that was staked into the ground like a foreclosure sign in the yard. So this is a piece that I made in 2008 during the market crash, so I think that was definitely on my mind at the time. The piece, is, um, the piece on the left is entitled uh, Four Signs to Suicide Prevention. Uh, the text was appropriated from an old handbook that I found when I was an operator on a crisis and suicide prevention hotline. Um, the piece on the right is um, entitled Codependence, Misunderstood, Mistreated. Um, these pieces were made by sewing together machine knit pieces of uh, fabric, dipping them in white house paint, backing them by a disaster blanket, and then spray painting them as veritable calls for help. So in thinking about this piece, I was interested in the way that I could create this tension between the tired, lethargic, and physically heavy fabrics and the potential that they had um, to create a kind of heroic gesture. And while both of these pieces are incredibly direct and emotional, there's an ambiguity in what or who they're addressing. In addition, in the case of the piece on the right, it's unclear as to whether the disease in question is depression, fibromyalgia, breast cancer, or AIDS. So this next piece entitled Triage is the first that I'm going to show you that begins to employ the use of found objects or facsimiles of found objects. Um, the title is again taken from Triaging an Emergency Situation. I always start by reading off the materials list because I think that there's a certain amount of importance that the list plays. I think about it as a form of poetry in and of itself. So this is handwoven hemp, nail polish, spray paint, indigo, logwood, toilet paper, greeting cards, gay pride pins, self-help books, plaster, yarn, handmade wooden sign by a man from the Oregon coast who died shortly after fabricating it, denim and gloves. So all of the fabrics that you see here have been handwoven, and the abstract line wavy pattern on the far left is by painting the warp threads with nail polish and then streaking them across the cloth with the beater mechanism on the loom, creating a, this kind of faux ecot look. So here's some um, details of the objects here. Um, while I was working on this piece, I found a quote 
from uh, an essay called The Deaths of Camp, written by Carol Flynn. It's part of an anthology called Camp, Queer Aesthetics and the Performing Subject. And she wrote that camp is thus a scavenger, scrounging history's waste in order to rediscover surplus value from forgotten forms of labor. So while I was making this piece, I was thinking a lot about my own methods of scavenging through history's waste, scavenging through thrift stores, through queer history, through fiber history. I wanted to think about a way that I could accumulate history's waste into a large scale installation, accumulating found and made objects and looking at the spatial relationships between the objects. So one of the things that I really liked formally about triage was the way that it had this certain declarative quality to it, but there was also this intrinsic tendency it had to organize itself. There were all these pockets that were starting to become a bit obsessive, and I started to get really paranoid that an unfilled or undefined pocket was the equivalent of um, the practice of giving someone a purse with nothing in it, which, um, according to a friend of mine, is a, is a terrible social faux pas. So um, I always think about these kind of so social mores while I'm making the work. I also thought in this case it was really strange that there was a pattern where you could organize your own quotidian drudgery. Like I just thought like, you know, who has time for that? But I guess I do. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, I always think that um, I always reach some kind of tipping point in my work where I decide that I'm completely suffocated by my own source material. And Similar to the idea of cleaning house, I feel as though I have to wipe the material slate clean and start over. So after making these pieces where the external content was really abrasively assaulting the objects, I wanted to step back and think about how I might be able to summon this relationship to the fabric art movement of the early 1970s as a way of gaining a political platform for the work through the suggestion of a form. So could I immobilize the kind of radicalism or urgency of the queer, li or queer liberation or of fiber history through merely the use of crocheted hemp on this protest sign-like trellis? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that I ask myself as I make the work, regardless of whether I achieve my goals. Um, so strangely enough, despite my attempts to strip the surface of these works down to a form, I ultimately end up bringing, building them back up. So this piece is kind of appropriately or ironically entitled House Cleaning. Um, so it's four feet by eight feet, and it's composed of a wooden trellis armature, a blue denim bow, a gold spray paint, a gold spray paint, sequin trim, gay pride pins, plaster, a laminated adver sign advertising someone who will organize your life for you, hemp, and indigo. So um, again, I like this idea that house cleaning here is not a process of removing, but is instead a process of hyper embellishment. Um, and I also, while I was making this piece, read this great quote by feminist theorist Anne McClintock, who talks about house cleaning as a kind of liminal space in and of itself. She describes it as the semiotics of boundary maintenance, which I really love. So after living in Eugene for three years, I moved to San Francisco about 10 years ago um, to take up my current teaching position at the California College of the Arts. And this is the first piece that I made during that transition. This is called Blessings and Miracles, and it's indigo, silk handkerchief, pins, hand-woven and crocheted wool and hemp, handmade felt, nail polish, letter organizer made by a pr prisoner, um, jewelry, spray paint, guide to dungeon emergencies, and gifts on linen. So this piece began to with a visit to Mr. S. Leather, which is a famous handmade BDSM fetish store in San Francisco. And on the counter near the cash register was this small book, The Guide to Dungeon Emergencies. It's actually one of the first books that I bought when I moved to San Francisco. So the fascinating thing about this book is not so much that it's so kind of um, sexually lascivious, but it's actually m kind of the opposite, that it includes this list of conditions that could befall you in a vulnerable moment of sexual transgression. So these are things like asthma, escalating arguments, police at the door, jammed knots, these kinds of issues that come up in dungeons. Um, so um, here's another detail of the same piece. Um, in this image, you can see that I've woven one of the conditions um, with a weave structure that's known as summer and winter, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. There's also this pin from the HRC that I've included, not so much because I support the organization. This is always like a sticking point in the lecture. People are like, it's so heteronormative. I just think it really matches and accessorizes the colors really nicely. So um, that's important. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, my work moves between these different histories. Um, and implicit within these discourses are my understanding of textiles as viable manifestos. So etymologically, the word textile is derived from the Latin texir, which means to weave. 
The root is also the source of other English words, which include context, pretext, and texture. So similar to the um, relationship of language to syntax, the synergy between material and structure in a textile allows us to transmit new vernaculars, rich with double meanings, false supports, and anxious potentials. Unlike traditional written manifesto manifestos, however, I love that textiles can complicate our understanding of address and urgency. Speaking through textiles changes our means of inquiry and expression. I'm always asking myself how we can say something urgently through the slowest means possible. And in this slowed down space of making, how does the construction of identity occupy a space that could connect these seemingly antithetical statements, or sentiments rather? Desire and ambivalence, making and unmaking, calamity and perseverance. So here I've woven um, kind of the individual texts and then framed them. Um, so this is, again, a structure called Summer and Winter. It's a two-sided reversible weave structure that was used in the 19th century to create American coverlet weavings, among other things. Um, there, was some there were a couple of nice things about it. So structurally, it could be used to create complex weave structures um, with a relatively simple floor loom. You didn't need anything too, too fancy. Here I'm using it to write text, for example. And aesthetically, it was great because it was light on one side and dark on the others. So the colors were seasonably appropriate all year round. You could kind of flip it based on what, it, what uh, season it was. So I, I guess the thing that I like about the integration of the structure and the text is the way that they can both speak to moments of transition or anxiety through sexuality, illness, or simply through seasonal change. So these ideas around malice and protection, transitional space, reversibility, inversion, led me to produce this solo exhibition um, in New York in 2012 called Longtime Companion. So Longtime Companion is taken from the expression the New York Times once often used to describe the surviving same-sex partner of someone who died from AIDS. It was also the title of the first feature-length film about AIDS to receive wide distribution in the US. So this film that was directed by Norman Rene is actually very terrible. It's very cheesy and very hard to watch. Um, and it just doesn't hold up well to the test of time. So this exhibition was really, I was really interested in how I could literally feel my way through this somewhat awkward and dated expression and the ways that I could negotiate a sense of urgency and ambivalence while alluding to the enduring and complex political issues surrounding Im intimacy, language, and privacy. So at the center of these exhibition, or this exhibition were two custom-designed red cedar sculptures. Um, and there were these woven replicas of PFLAG newsletters, which were set into the face of each unit. So PFLAG is parents and friends of lesbians and gays. And in the 90s, this was the kind of, you know, you'd come out of the closet, and then you'd bring your parents to a support group. It was so cringy and terrible. Anyway, it happened. So. Um, there would be the, so there were these newsletters that I recreated in, in jacquard weaving, and then I uh, put them into the face of each unit. And then there were these potpourri pies and wax cupcakes and collections of books um, that lined these shelves. Um, the sculptures mirrored each other. So there was one piece called Summer, and in parentheses, Dino Z Mylock. Um, that's the piece that you see in the foreground, and it includes a replica of a summer newsletter from P Flag, as well as a collection of books by craft writer Dino, Donna Z. Mylock, who was a kind of precursor to Martha Stewart. And then in the back, you see this other sculpture called Winter, um, and in parentheses, it's called Anne Rule, which features a winter newsletter and a collection of true crime books by Anne Rule. So Rule came to prominence while researching a book on the Ted Bund or researching the Ted Bundy murders. Um, Bundy was uh, unidentified as the killer at the time, and Rule had unknowingly befriended him as a fellow employee on a suicide hotline. So she was kind of living amongst a killer. So these books revel in this suburban panic of domestic life while telling this cautionary tale of normal people gone awry. So I like to think of these books as a kind of modern day equivalent to um, Agatha Christie. So an important com component of both the summer and winter pieces was that they could, they had this trap door that slid out from underneath the structure, which I could recharge with cedar shavings and lavender oil. So lavender, cedar shave, and here I kind of like it too because it looks a little like a litter box, but you don't see it when you're like, you know, you know, you push that back in when it's on display. <laughs> so, um, 
So all of this was a, this attempt to ward off potential infestation. About a year before I started making this work, I received a call from a curator at the Seattle Art Museum where I'd been exhibiting Endless Night. And the curator's voice sounded really timid when I spoke to her. And she was kind of concerned, and she said, um, Josh, I'm really sorry, but um, your piece is infested with moths, and we have to fumigate. And um, as the artist of this piece, I was really filled with all this embarrassment and shame. It was as though somebody had called me up and been like, you gave me an STD. Like, that's <laughs> fucked up, you know? And so I really had this, like, overcompensation thing that I needed to do. So I was like, okay, from now on, I'm going to ward off all potential infestation, maybe even ward off HIV with this. Like, something is going to happen. Um, but it was very much about this kind of neurosis that I was experiencing at the time. So here's the back side of this piece. You see there's this homemade lip balm that I make. Sometimes when I get kind of depressed, I like start venturing into this like craft world of like, you know, making things like homemade lip balm. <laughs> or jam, that's another favorite of mine. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so again, there's th these different kinds of support narratives that are um, being brought into this work. And also thinking about the kind of fantasy of fiction as another kind of support in this work. Um, another thing that I, that I was thinking a lot about and then I bring through in a lot of my other works is that there's all this um, passive aggressive gift giving in the work. Like I put all of these objects and things that I make and then I often re-gift things. So like my friend gave me this thing called, um, what do you call it, Russian tea? which is basically just tang mixed with tea. And then he put it in a mason jar and gave it to me as a Christmas present. So I re-gifted it into the sculpture. And the idea is that kind of like an infomercial, like if you buy this sculpture, then you get like all of this stuff for free, you know? So <laughs> I really, <laughs> I'm really thinking about generosity here. Um, this is a piece that was also in the exhibition called It Takes a Lifetime to Get Exactly Where You Are. Um, so this is handwoven sequin trim, handwoven hemp, cedar blocks, cotton, polyester, wool, cochineal dye made from ground up bugs, straw hat with lace, toilet paper, paper towels, scrapbooking letters, jacquard woven reproduction of a panel from the AIDS quilt, silk handkerchief, indigo, political pins, disaster blanket, gourd, gold leaf, plaster caps, cedar blocks, and nail polish. And this is about 20 feet long by about eight feet tall. The title of this piece kind of came about while I was at a, a diner in San Francisco and the the um, the waitress was a drag queen and there was another party that was sitting next to us and they were getting kind of um, nasty and the and the drag queen just turned to them and they were like you know they were like her you know what's the like what's the weight and everything like that and she's like Honey, it takes a lifetime to get exactly where you are. And I was like, oh, I'm going to use that as the title of this piece. <laughs> um, but I was also thinking about these pieces as pegboards, like the, the ones that people hang in their garages and thinking about utilitarianism in terms of physical, not just like physical usefulness, but also these tools for survival. So here you see a, a detail. And I brought back the kind of um, guide to dungeon emergency things here as well. So coming off the heels of the Longtime Companion Project, I was kind of experiencing this weird post-show depression. And I had simultaneously just been invited to propose the site-specific installation for SF MoMA, and I was really thinking, it was really racking my brain because I'd never done anything site-specifically before. Um, and so my friend invited me to a field trip that he was having with his class to the San Francisco Columbarium which is a place that I'd heard him talk about but had never really visited before. So the Columbarium, which is in the R Richmond District in San Francisco, is this repository for human ashes. It's the only non-denominational burial place within San Francisco's city limits that's open to the public. It's designed as a neoclassical three-floor rotunda, and the space is lined with glass vitrines inhabited by bizarre personal effects that in essence memorialize the inhabitants there. So in this way, the space is a veritable archive of San Francisco cultural history. Another really important aspect of the history of this space is how it came into prominence. Although the building was erected in 1898, it was left largely in a state of disrepair until 1979, when caretaker Emmett Watson made it his life's work to restore a sense of dignity to the columbarium. 
Coincidentally, the restoration of the columbarium happened to parallel the initial surge of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. So when I first visited the columbarium, I was struck by the ways that the experience of walking through the halls of the columbarium is, um, is one engaged in a kind of remaking of queer history po or queer identity politics through these often humorous and domestic items. Um, it's, it's this accidental AIDS memorial. And I thought to myself, I should really do a project here. So the um, SFMOMA exhibition at the Neptune Society Columbarium is this attempt to forge a connection between the ways the objects in the columbarium and the materials in my own work start to ventriloquize narratives around um, identity and language. Again, thinking about like the, the pegboard there. So um, the, the piece on the right, or the object on the, sorry, on the right here is a teddy bear that's actually in one of the niches and it's just covered in these gay pride pins. It's part of somebody's memorial. Um, but then um, I also decided to, pro to propose the title of this project as Be Bold for What You Stand For, Be Careful for What You Fall For after finding this hand-lettered sign at an estate sale in Marin County. And I guess what I loved about the phrase was that it speaks to the complexities of engaging and formulating urgent self-expression while also signaling the dangers of being culturally impressionable. So the piece got approved by SF MoMA, and it's this very, uh, it's actually a three-part installation, but I'm only showing you the kind of, the first piece that appears in the main atrium of the main hall of the, of the columbarium. So here you see hand-dyed, hand-woven, and crocheted hemp, wool uh, cochineal made from ground-up bugs, indigo, silver lame yarn, pretzels made of plastic, spilled nail polish, nachos made of rubber, chocolate chip cookies made of plastic, onion rings made of rubber, pins, greeting cards. Whenever you go to the columbarium, you'd be surprised at how many snacks there are lying around. Like people are bringing bags of chips, Snapple bottles, somebody put their ashes in a gefilte fish container, and then their partner put their ashes in a Chinese con food container, and they sit side by side in one of the niches. So I just think like the idea of having snacks for the dead is like a really incredible gesture, and I wanted to include that into the work. Um, also, snacks are just a really fascinating relation. They have fascinating relationships to time. They're kind of liminal things in and of themselves because they're in between meals. And I dyed all of this work in this palette that was inspired by William Morris's work where he was really only using natural dyes. And I think that a lot of that was just based on the, the physical history of this building being built at the turn of the 20th century. So this um, question about how we kind of memorialize people or names or what kind of, we, whenever you go to the columbarium, you just see these names that are somewhat anonymous on, on some level. Um, and there's a kind of democracy to the naming of things. You know, uh, there's um, the well-known artist Martin Wong is in one of the niches, so he has maybe a little more name recognition. But then there are people that, um, you know, weren't necessarily celebrities or, or famous artists, and, th and you just see, like, name after name after name. And it's similar to the way that the, the AIDS quilt works as well. So I wanted to continue thinking about this idea of naming, and I developed this, inst uh, this exhibition called Christmas Creep in 2014. So I've included um, a few installation shots that you can get a sense of how the exhibition came together. But essentially, each sculpture is titled after a specific individual or group of individuals all of whom have been, who I've been romantically attached to in the past. So again, this process of naming is more or less of an organizing principle. I didn't want these to be like um, portraits of people that I had dated in the past, but just thinking about like what happens when you um, summon a name in the first place or a first name. Um, but I was really interested in this statement that I read in, in Derrida's on grammatology, where he writes that names are at once singular and singularly untranslatable, but they're also specific and specifically general. So all the names that appear in the show, Andrew, Edward, Greg, Benjamin, Steve, Bill, Jim, Jason, and Max, are all tied to a particular referent, but the specificity of that reference evaporates when the context is altered. So aside from using nomenclature as a means of galvanizing this work, I also wanted to continue to explore notions of transition, temporality, psychological attachment um, that had all been part of the previous work that I had been doing. Um, Christmas creep is a marketing strategy. 
um, that many of you may know. It's where the, the holiday season starts earlier and earlier each year. So we know that it's time to jingle jangle our bells when Starbucks starts selling pumpkin spice lattes and Christmas decorations come to cohabit with rubber masks and plastic jack-o'-lanterns on departmental store shelves. I like the idea that these hi highly delineated seasonal customs could meld into each other, that they could overlap and blend into these grotesque hybrids so that seasonal transitions are blurred and temporality becomes both specific and kind of irrelevant at the same time. So all, as a way to make this connection, I hand dyed all of the works in this exhibition in colors that were predicted by the fall winter 2014 fashion forecast. And I wanted to see what would happen if it looked like all of the sculptures were de designed in such a way that they were kind of seasonably appropriate for the duration of the exhibition before they became unfashionable and started to provoke a kind of anxiety that you, m you might accompany like wearing white shoes after Labor Day or something like that. You know, like, um, again, bringing these social mores into the work. This is Greg. This is Max. Um, there's this large tie-dyed cloth that look that's clothespinned to the left of the work, which was um, dyed with this low immersion dye process. And there's this kind of also this translucency to the work. Um, so you kind of see through to the back side of the piece, and there's like this piece of silk on the back side, so that there's this kind of translucency with the gold lame that's going there as well. Um, I love these two pins. One says, you're a great cure for happiness. And the other one says, I can't cope with pastel colors. You know, there's a lot of like minor disappointments and major disappointments in this work. You know, like a minor disappointment might be like a spilled glass of wine, whereas a major disappointment might be a breakup or a disease. Um, so this is movies. Craig, Mike, Michael, Paul, Matt, Ben, Andy. This is hand-woven gold lame and hemp dyed in hand dyed in fashionable shades of blue black sequin letters laminated personal ads from the hobby directory glittered clothespins witness on vhs onion rings made of rubber and jacquard woven movie calendar from a residential hotel in san francisco on a cedar support so essentially this piece is one large movie calendar it's an advertisement from a residential hotel that used to um, exist a block from my house in san francisco that i found in one of the gay and lesbian archives Another component within this piece is the use of these laminated pages from a zine that in existed in the 1940s called the Hobby Directory. So this is like truly fascinating. I can't believe this existed. This is like an early form of Craigslist. Um, when Craigslist, you could actually have sex through Craigslist. Um, but it was this zine where it was, it was international. Like there were listings from all over the world. And you could write these um, advertisements that would say like, I'm a 40-year-old man interested in knitting with another younger man, um, maybe making a ship in a bottle together. And it's like all like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So I think that that's fabulous, right? So, um, so I, I included those I remade the zine, and then I included the pages in um, the piece itself. And I continue to remake them. Eventually, I'd like to bind them into a book if I can find a publisher. So um, this is Edward. This is um, hand-woven gold lame and hemp, hand-dyed in shades of daffodil, cardinal red, raspberry, indigo, and tea leaves to match the color forecast of 2014-2015. Silk bedazzled seashell ashtray from Palm Springs, a spilled mug made of resin and clay, and silkwood on VHS on a cedar support. Um, although all of these sculptures interrogate the way that support and attachment function physically, materially, and psychologically, one important aspect of this work was the way that all of these exes collectively form a kind of queer space where intimacies exist post-breakup. So I'm one of those people that doesn't kill my exes. Like I, you know, like I don't kill them off and like, you know, from my life, you know, they're always kind of lurking around. And I think that's a very queer gesture. Um, and so I have this fantasy that I'm going to like become this old person in like a retirement home with all of my exes like around me. I kind of like that. 
And of course, um, no conversation about relationship is complete without discussing one night stands. So these are simply single strips of names that were used compositionally within the exhibition as a way to break up space to punctuate the rest of the sculptures in the show. So slum would, some would slump to the floor, others appeared surreptitiously near the ceilings, corners, and thresholds. In essence, these one night stands do what they do best. They fill time and space between relationships. This is David and Kevin. Um, so after processing Christmas creep with my friends and my therapist, I kept thinking about how these pieces function as attachments. So from a psychological perspective, I was interested in how we know what we know via our attachments with things and people. And at the same time, I was thinking about all the physical attachments on the surface of the work as both supports and accessories, and maybe even thinking about an accessory both in the way that it suggests something that that's an optional attachment as well as something that could connect to a person to something more serious, like an accessory to a crime. So this piece is actually called Attachments. And in a sense, I think of this piece like another kind of bulletin board, a space that represents both a community's desire to speak while formally looking like something akin to a formal collage. So the frames that you see here are culled from those early Dover clip art books from the 1980s and 1990s. Um, these images came from a book that was, they were actually called Ready to Use Contemporary Small Frames and Borders, and it was written by a guy who uses the pen name Dan X Solo. I love that you need a pseudonym <laughs> to write a book on clip art. <laughs> so to me, these images represent the lowest value aesthetically, but at the same time, they can be chopped up easily, reassembled, and reconstituted through the process of weaving and piecework. So here are some details of the work. In the image on the right, you see an advertisement from a chiropractor specializing in injuries post a rough BDSM session. Um, these are, um, uh, I don't know, they're not so much newer works, but th this is like from 2015. So um, this is where I start to kind of, um, I'm thinking about moments of address and abstraction within documents in general, like really looking at archives and thinking about the way that pages operate, like the left side of the book and a right side of the book, and thinking about these flyers that start to inform the work. So this is called Phone Tree, and it started with an archive, a, a phone tree that I found in, a, in an LGBT archive from a queer punk house. Um, this is 96 inches by 76 inches. Um, and so there's a bit of historical fantasy that's going on here, but this was a weird instance where after I exhibited this piece, somebody came up to me and they were like, I was actually, my name's on there. And I was like, what, are you kidding? You know, so it was this weird thing where um, like reality and fantasy kind of come together. Like I think about these archives as being so old that like, of course, nobody's going to be like really summoned through this, but actually somebody's old telephone number was on here, which they were like so ecstatic that I had somehow like memorialized their, their, their support through this piece. Um, this piece is called Issues. It began with a found advertisement for a gay traffic school from the early 1990s. Um, it's a two-part diptych. Uses this uh, process called ice dyeing. It's a very impre imprecise dyeing <laughs> process where you literally just dump a bunch of dye on ice and let it kind of seep into the fabric in this kind of random way. It's very saturated. Um, this is a piece called Trick List. So um, in a lot of these LGBT archives, there's usually always at least one or two trick lists, like um, men collecting the names of the people that they'd slept with and then um, wanting to donate them to the archives. So I included the trick list of a gentleman in this work. Um, and I also just like that um, there's this kind of sense of intergenerationality that's going into these works. Um, the one of the pieces that I think I'm going to show you next, while I was using this, tr oh no, 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 okay. So in addition to the trick list, I found this very strange anonymous piece of paper that had two sides to it. One, it's on one side it said the things we liked about the old days, and then on the other side it said the things that we like about safer sex. So it was kind of this like rap session that was done at some kind of community support group trying to somehow list or document or index all the things that they liked about the old days versus the newer days. 
And um, so I started using some of that text in the work. So the trick list you see actually on the surface of the piece, but on the right it just says the bushes. That was like what I guess the good old days were like, the bushes. Um, the piece on the right is called Trigger Warnings, Nail Polish Abstraction. And then the piece on the left is called Taking the Road Less Frazzled. Um, and so I think that there's, um, what does that say? Oh, fear of paranoia, or lack of paranoia on the left, and then fantasy on the right is what the text says. This piece is called um, I Forgot Where I I forgot where I am while I'm at where I'm going, um, which is, I think, the title of an episode of um, Designing Women. So it's from 2017. It's hand-dyed, hand-woven gold lame and hemp, walnut custom shelving, the entire inventory of ta Titanic on VHS from a video store that was on the brink of closure, pens, and a self-help book, and series of self-help books. So I made this right after the election, <laughs> so I think that it kind of <laughs> speaks for itself. And I went to this video store, and I was like, what do you have the most of? And he was like, the Titanic. And so I was like, I'll take them all. And um, <laughs> I like the idea that you know the piece is kind of lopsided, like the Titanic is like pulling this piece down on the right side. Um, but I also like, um, and then there's this text that says abandon on it as well. So there is this sense that this piece is very disorienting or distracted, or that the ecot that you're seeing here, this kind of tie-dye look, is somehow creating a distraction or a decoy from like the real matter at hand. So all of these ice dyed and, and decorative decoys culminated into an, uh, it's kind of an unusual opportunity. The invitation to produce a 50 foot weaving entitled Sanctuary. Um, so this piece was at St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in Seattle until I think it came down last summer. Um, so I've been, t or two summers ago. So I've been telling people that as a gay Jew from the Midwest, this is my Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act moment. Um, <laughs> The context for this piece really came together pretty organically. A year, a few years ago, I received a call from Bill and Ruth True, who are two very generous art collectors, who created a space called Western Bridge in Seattle. In 2010, I'd done a short two-week project at Western Bridge, and I hadn't heard from them in a number of years. So somewhat mysteriously, Bill and Ruth said that they'd seen my columbarium project and asked if I could fly up to Seattle con to conceive of a project for an active cathedral. So upon first visit, I was struck by the collision of various architectural forms here in the cathedral, the commanding Gothic structures, the mid-century brick facades and stained glass entrance, compounded by the 1990s-inspired rose-tinted windows. Despite the charmingly schizophrenic array of styles, the presence of the, the towering 70-foot columns that line the interior of the building offered a means to not only unify the cathedral visually, but also to provide a structural and perhaps metaphorical support to the congregation. So when I went home, I started thinking about the ways that I could use, um, or that I could make the aforementioned correlations. I thought about my own love of pop music, and I started researching the cultural reception of some of my favorite records. So after a quick Google search around Belinda Carlisle's 1987 album, Heaven on Earth, I realized that a subculture of bloggers have analyzed Carlyle's album as a thinly veiled hymnal, where a listener can at once find entertainment as well as spiritual transcendence. So every song has the potential to oscillate between otherworldly eroticism and sacred devotion. And it was precisely this ambivalence in archival material, in this case an anthemic pop album, that promoted, or that rather prompted, no, uh, I promote it is the word I'm looking for. An interesting collapse between what we consider to be idiosyncratic and what we consider to be symbolic. So I was also thinking a lot about directionality in this piece. One of the challenges of this work was that it had to make sense visually and conceptually, both as, a, as this tall 50-foot piece in a cathedral, as well as in Bill and uh, Ruth True's private residence, which is not 70 feet tall. Um, and that was where the piece was at least initially going to exist permanently. So to do this, I thought about the ways that most albums have an A side and a B side. The A side is typically all the hits, and the B side contains all the weird rarities and deep cuts. 
for me, I wanted to organize the A side as everything with red and blue streaks, while the B side would be this indigo and red streaking side. And I could display it as this big, tall piece in the church, and when it came d um, time, time to redisplay the work, I could bisect the piece in half and hang the two sides next to each other. So at the same time I was thinking about Belinda Carlisle, I was also in the midst of binge watching the first season of Passions, which is a rather campy daytime soap opera, which articulates the battle between good and evil through the lens of suburban dystopia in a town called Harmony, which first debuted in 1999. So somehow these two archives of information, Heaven on Earth and Passions, started forming an obtuse narrative that could be brought together using the matrix of woven, woven cloth. So I wanted to bring in a clip from Passions so that you get a sense of just how bizarre it really is. Um, it was created by James E. Riley, which is who is a writer from Days of Our Lives. And many of you might remember that in the mid-1990s, Days of Our Lives took this supernatural turn where one of its main characters, Marlena, gets possessed by the devil. So as a result of the popularity of the demonic plot twist, Riley realized that his soap operas no longer needed to be based in reality, and he created Passions in 1999 and just went like full on supernatural. So the clip that I'm gonna show you is, um, it consists of a particularly disturbing scene where the laptop of one of the main characters, Faith, is um, possessed by the dark forces of Tabitha, the next door neighbor witch who's secretly we wreaking havoc on the town of Harmony. Give me strength. What in the world? Hello, Faith. You thought you could run away from me, didn't you? left side of the work are these double woven pockets and each one contains a series of episodes from the first season of Passions. So I like that the episodes read a little like Bible scripture. Um, and on the left you can also see some of the other elements that were affixed to this piece, a gay zine called Potpourri and several pins. This one that you see here, the black one, says, um, be kind, I have a teenager. And then there's another one that I really love that just says, I may be LOLing on the outside but I'm WTFing on the inside. <laughs> So as I started to work in this piece, I felt that there was still something missing, something that could ground the fiction of the work to something um, local, to something real. So it was at this moment that I discovered the archives of Peter Halleck, who's the founder of the St. Mark's Compline Choir, and the archives of Tim Mayhew, a Seattle activist. So despite the obvious contemporary subtext, the title of this work, Sanctuary, come from the name of an early queer club um, founded in a consecrated church on Boren Street a venue that was closed in 1985 following a string, of or a string of police stings and court battles. In memorial articles found among the Mayhew archives, past attendees remember the sanctuary as a den of sin and a, s and a safe haven, sometimes as both. So on the left is an advertisement to the gay club, the sanctuary that looks a lot like an advertisement for a church or a religious sanctuary. And on the right is a bizarre sexual questionnaire which crudely tries to pathologize queer sexual behavior. And then, the eternal flame. So um, the last few works I'm gonna show you are pieces that I've generated over the past year or so as a way to continue these ideas around the visual manifestations of support. 
Um, I stumbled across these two books, The Gay Area's Telephone Directory from 1982 and The Unofficial Gay Manual from 1995. Gay Areas was a phone book style guide that listed queer friendly um, establishments and services, identifying safe spaces in an era before legislation of LGBTQ plus civil rights. The publication was issued for over a decade, primarily during the 80s, and had a peak distribution of 150,000 nationwide. On the right, you'll also see the hopelessly outdated book entitled The Unofficial Gay Manual, a goodie that I picked up at a secondhand store in Palm Springs. Written in 1994 by Kevin DeLalo and Jack Krumholtz, the book purports to function as a support resource for a newly out-of-the-closet homosexual men, a relic from a generation that has since passed due to the AIDS epidemic and the proliferation of the internet. From the book, I was particularly intrigued by a series of illustrations that indexes the qualities and pr products that aid in identifying a quote-unquote gay living space. These include, but are not limited to, scalamandre silk throw pillows, dramatic dark painted walls with light colored trim, and self-portraits. Though humorously out of step, I'm interested in the way that these texts speak relative to issues of taste and community. So here, on, here you see um, that I've appropriated the text from the gay areas in a manner that gives clues to the vast varieties of these businesses, alcohol treatment centers, barbershops, house cleaning, pet supply services, and steam baths. On the right-hand side of the work is this industrially woven image of a brick wall from a photograph that I took around my neighborhood in San Francisco. Collectively, I see these two sides as dueling between access and obstacle, support and resistance. This piece is called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. I've also started changing the armatures that physically support the work. In this piece, entitled Misplaced Modifier, I use powder-coated steel feet, which allow the textiles to snake around the space in an almost serpentine, modular-like format. And thinking, and, and thinking about this piece, I, made as a I thought about this piece as a delayed response to my unpleasant experience working in the publishing industry another lifetime ago. And I was also thinking about the metaphor of a misplaced modifier, a phrase placed awkwardly within a sentence so that it unintentionally refers to the wrong word, which I think is something that I kind of do in my work automatically. Um, and I also like the idea of creating an object where there's business on the front and party on the back. So this piece on the left is called Interiority Complex, and the piece on the right is called The Cosmetic Affect of Darkness. Um, so it's handwoven gold lame and cotton, handwoven hemp dyed in last season's expired dye, an indigo gay pen, half gay pen, two lists generated from a support group meeting on powder coated steel. So uh, the list that you see here on on the right is that list I was talking about about like the safer sex versus the good old days. That actually became directly embedded into the work. Um, so we're getting towards the end, and this is like kind of moving to like around 2018, so just last year. So you're gonna you see the use of the um, language that I appropriated from the unofficial gay manual as a kind of literal or metaphorical springboard. This is a piece called "Excuse Me for Living." I almost called this work "Between the Living Room and the Bedroom," um, which is a Jasper Johns painting, since the text panel on the left, or sorry. Between a clock and the bed is the Jasper Johns painting. And so I was thinking about something similar, like the idea of um, the text panel on the left is from all the gay trappings found in a living room, and the panel on the right are all these accoutrements from a stereotypical gay bedroom, and then there's this kind of abstraction in the middle. But it became called Excuse Me for Living. And then there's a bag clip and a bisexual pride pin. You don't see those so much. Um, this piece is called Behind Closed Drawers. So in contrast to the other text-based works that I've produced, these words are woven structurally into the cloth. Here I've chosen to write each word with a Sharpie marker on the vertical warp of the cloth before the weft has been added. The effect renders each letter as though it was produced in a style of te televisual ecot. And on the right of the work are a series of collected VHS tapes, also from a failing video store, all of them copies of Boys on the Side, a 1990s era drama known for its depiction of representing a heterosexual woman with AIDS. So Boys on the Side is on the side. This is a piece called Travesty. Um, travesty was taken from a word defined as a disaster that could be described as a farce or a degraded imitation. So here um, I've collected and represented a series of objects that oscillate in tone between domestic support and domestic menace. All the videos engage in this feeling of anxious paranoia, the complete guide to home security, 
avalanche, quake, avoiding roofing disasters, among many others. At the same time, the work borrows its aesthetics from cozy patchworks, Mary Englebright borders, and hand-painted trinkets used to warm the home. Collectively, the, ob the cloth and the objects function queerly as surrogates for the restless, often conflicting impulses that define identity within the domestic space. So these works around detection, abstraction, and decoration led me to produce my most recent exhibition, Both Things Are True, at Kope Asner Gallery in Glasgow this fall. Um, this show just closed last week, so I'm still very much thinking about my language here. As a whole, the show continues this exploration of how we express ambivalence, particularly as it relates to dueling sentiments around the transmission of self. Within, these exhibition, within this exhibition, AIDS vigils, soap operas, candy baskets, pre-internet era systems of support, and codes of decor are fo forced to negotiate a psychic space again between the idiosyncratic and the symbolic. And in each presentation, a handmade textile object is loosely juxtaposed against a large um, photo mural appropriated from 1990s era back issues of an interiors magazine. So in Both Things Are True, um, the works in the gallery appear against a photograph of Cher's 1991 New York City abode, a stylistically promiscuous home in shades of hazy pink and leopard print. So here you can see a few installation images of the show, and even though the documentation doesn't quite capture the illusion, I really wanted to consider a group of works that look as though they could actually fit within Cher's living room. This is um, called Organized Living. So a year ago, um, while kind of scavenging through the dredges of the internet, I discovered a website which specializes in, among other things, the sales of bootleg home videos. So buried within the site, I landed on an anonymous vendor who is duplicating and distributing a series of 46 DVDs ripped from the longest-running American soap opera, Days of Our Lives. So again, going back to passions, but back to Days of Our Lives. So spanning four years of a daytime television show, which airs five days a week, the seller obsessively edited the videos that he collected into a single supercut, tracing the narrative arc of Will Horton and Sonny Kiriakis, the series' first same-sex supercouple. So for me, at a time when generational specificity and legibility of queer sensibilities has moved to an increasingly ambivalent space, this document serves as a tender work of art in its own right, a witness to a feverish search for gay subjectivity. Organized living functions as a painting, viewing station, and archive of the aforementioned supercuts. Part of it, so it's become part of this larger series that I'm working on, which will ultimately house the, materi um, the material contained on the 46 DVDs. Um, each work that I've produced so far archives and redisplays five weekdays' worth of media against a hand-crocheted textile. So that's kind of the structure of this project. Um, this is another piece in the same series called Will to Live. Um, this is a piece called Positive Light. So in addition to the Days of Our Lives works, I've also continued to mine the gay manual for language around how one might be able to detect the presence of gay men in a moment of generational temporality. In this work, and in the next work that I'm going to show you, I've juxtaposed this language against images of crowds. So I think of these crowds as witnesses that are employed in both celebratory and mournful ways. And I'm very interested in the idea of mourning sickness, which is this collective emotional condition of recreational grieving. And it was the word that was used when Princess Diana died, um, that that celebrity spectacle created a kind of um, collective grieving. It's also where we get the idea of grief porn from. Um, this is a piece called um, The Risks of Overexposure. So on the other hand, this crowd was abstracted and appropriated from a crowd photographed at Bette Midler's Divine Miss M Tour from 2016. Um, and you know, I'm starting to think about how I can hide things in plain sight, bringing back the credenza. In addition to the wall works, I've also produced a series of floor works and baskets. Each of them capitalize off of their nooks, crannies, and compartments. This piece is called The Poodle. It's hand-dyed, hand-woven basket reed, duct tape, resin, lint rollers, gold powder, strawberry hard candies, death trap on VHS, a VHS tape purchased from a man who recorded hours of news footage from Princess Diana's funeral, hourglass, ceramic clock on pedestal. And because these are candy baskets, I think there's this obvious reference to Felix Gonzalez Torres. This is called obnoxious personality disorder. 
It's this hand-woven paper, gold spray paint, and uh, gold spray enamel, nail polish, reproductions of the Hobby Directory from 1950, steel wool, hard candy, unpaid parking ticket, VHS tapes purchased from a man who recorded hours of news footage from the Heaven's Gate suicide cult, secrets by Danielle Steele on hardcover, and stocking up a hardcover book um, uh, for a prepper on a pedestal. So there's different facets to the pedestals, and that's where a lot of these objects get placed. This is a piece called Knowing the Difference Between Mesan and Mikasa. So returning to this idea of, the idea of duplicity or double-sidedness, this work has a hippie tie-dye side and then a drag queen side. This is called Scare Snack Dicks. This is hand woven or hand dyed hand woven cotton, gold lame, hemp, nail polish, onion rings made of rubber, chocolate chip cookies made of resin, how to go to the movies written by Quentin Crisp, Muffin Mania, which is a spiral bound cookbook, the only cutter control book you'll ever need on paperback on a steel armature. And again, there's two sides to this piece, a sweet side and a savory side. And finally, this work, Off Night, which really comes full circle to one of the first pieces I showed you, Endless Night, a deconstructed image of the night sky that serves as a window into the other more interior works in the presentation. Hand-dyed, hand-woven hemp, cotton and gold lame, indigo socks that have lost their pair, sorry, indigo, socks that have lost their pair, a reproduction from the hobby directory, a collage made on paper pulp from correspondences with the California Tax Board, Spilled paint can, resin, denim, and a back issue of After Dark on powder-coated steel. So the object, um, so this object also appears against a wallpaper that I designed, and I just titled the wallpaper Mrs. Fields Gets a Makeover. So this is the back side of the work, which is essentially just a sheet of denim fabric with an applique pocket with a magazine that was um, not specifically a queer magazine, but it was a performing arts magazine that was um, usually traded or purchased um, between gay men. So again, part of this kind of lost generation of gay men. Um, so in conclusion, I thought I'd leave you with um, some final thoughts about this work and, and kind of some of the other works that I've been thinking about. And even though we're kind of living in this dark and scary moment in our country's history, and although this work doesn't speak as urgently as a protest in the street or other forms of direct activism, in the end, I hope that my larger project starts to suggest that if political rhetoric is at its core a desire to communicate, the ability to speak through textiles allows us to embrace a personal and political continuum that is at once inclusive, fragmentary, experiential, physical, and radical. So I thank you. Um, so I know I went over, but do we have time for questions? Okay, great. the exhibition you did with um with your exes yeah and and because they're still like around in your life what yeah were, what were their reactions to it um mixed so there's i mean nobody had a problem with it you know like everybody was like kind of excited about it you know but i think that some of them got a little confused because i had one ex that was like wait so did we watch silkwood together like what was that about you know like and so i think that many of them saw them as portraits of themselves especially the narcissistic ones. And so, um, so I, and I was like, you know what? It's not, it's not about you, actually. It's about me. And so, um, and so, you know, again, like, I thought of those pieces as kind of like when you go to the gas station and you buy a keychain and it has, like, the different names on it. Like, I kind of wanted to go more in that direction, but I also wanted to create this, like, queer network that I was talking about as well. So I think, you know, nobody was offended or felt like, um, why did you put me in there? But I think that the people that did recognize themselves in the work, they were like trying to somehow put everything together as though it was a portrait. Yeah, yeah. So again, like the, I think about them as different kinds of disasters or disappointments, you know, like, um, you know, like a spill, like, you know, don't cry over spilled milk, or like this idea of like spilling, um, spilling a wine glass. Like it's it's a bummer, right? But it was like juxtaposed within the context of like a major breakup, or juxtaposed within these 
relationships to the AIDS crisis or to other forms of illness or to other forms of, um, yeah, of sickness in general. And so I think about those ways that we triage emergency and how something um, really minor can trigger something major and vice versa, you know? So there's this constant confusion that I'm interested in between um, different kinds of disappointment and disaster that kind of like emerge and um, change, shift throughout the work. Um, so I think that's why I was starting to use like the fake foods, the spilled things. Well, the foods I'm always interested in because again, like snacks are just fascinating to me. But I think that the spills were something that I was thinking about as like both a gag and a joke, but also something that's like a real bummer. Yeah. So um, you construct your fabrics either with crochet or weaving. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to hear your idea of how you choose these different methods and what are their language for you? Yeah. And, you know, that's that's like this ongoing question that I have, you know, and a lot of it depends on how I'm going to present the work. Um, so I think that crochet very much is like a form of drawing for me because it's so organic and you can kind of stop it and start it whenever you like. And so it becomes this really easy, not easy, but it becomes this really suitable way to speak through ab speak through abstraction with crochet. Weaving is such a gridded kind of structural square kind of process where you have this very rectilinear plane that you're working with. So for things like text, it just makes a lot more sense to, to kind of do it on this gridded surface. Or if I'm kind of translating something from a photograph, then it becomes something that becomes woven or strip pieced together. So it kind of depends on where I'm borrowing something from, how I want to, how painterly I want something to be, how much I want to reference like abstraction. Um, and that usually becomes like the determining factor in terms of like what I use and how things work. Um, I also just make, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly making in the studio and work begets work kind of thing. And so, and I don't really know what I'm doing right at the beginning of the process. Like it kind of takes me accumulating a bunch of stuff until I can figure out like how things work. Um, and that goes, that's the same for the objects that I collect as well. Like I was telling somebody earlier today that it's like the idea of, you know, buying the prom dress before you have a prom to go to, you know, that you just, c I just constantly collect, especially when I'm in Palm Springs. It's just like a mecca for all things gay. And so, um, so I, uh, so I'll buy stuff and not really know where they're going to go. And then eventually it just makes sense, you know, like it's somehow the work that I'm doing with the textile and the, and the found objects start to speak to each other. Yeah. So Sanctuary is um, in the collection of the Henry, um, but it's also, it's it, there's a deal that's been worked out with the church. So anytime the church wants to rehang it, they're allowed to, um, but it's being conserved by the Henry. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, really. If it's going to be shown in the Henry, I think it has to be shown side by side. I don't think they have walls that are quite tall enough, but they have walls high enough to hang the side by side, to hang it side by side. I don't, I mean, I'm assuming I'll be told if it's up in and it's visible, um, but I think the church really wants to hang it again at some point. Like, I think that they were really sorry to kind of have it come down because it, it was really strange. Like when I first st started that project, they were really dubious and they kept asking me things like, well, can't you just weave like this really beautiful tapestry without putting all this shit? I mean, they didn't say shit because it's a church, but like without putting all this shit all over it. And I was like, oh, you mean the work? And so <laughs> it was like, um, so there was kind of this back and forth for a while, but I think once it went up and then like they missed, then like they totally forgot to tell me this like really amazing story, which was that um, there was a former dean that used weaving to mend the congregation back together at a time when the congregation felt really splintered. 
And so they didn't tell me this until like after the piece was already up. And I was like, wait, that's like a huge part of the history of this church. Like weaving is, is, is really in the fabric of the church. Um, so it was kind of great. And I think that they've been so, so, so supportive. They did a, an amazing performance at the church with um, Com the Compline Choir, where the Compline Choir did a Gregorian chant version of Heaven as a Place on Earth. It was so amazing. And they recited, um, they did a whole dramatic reinterpretation of Passions. It was like truly mind blowing. I was <laughs> like, this church is cool. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, your work is so layered with um, like historical references and yeah. references to your own personal history and all kind of tying back to like mostly queer experiences. Yeah. And I'm curious if when you're making and exhibiting, if you're thinking about um, the work as didactic or educational, or if mm -hmm. that's something you're, you're interested in the work doing at all? Yes and no. Like maybe accidentally I'm interested in those things. Like I, you know, like I, as I kind of hinted at in the last statement that I made, I don't see my work as really activist in nature because I think like when you're an activist, there's a kind of direct action that you're trying to employ and there's like a, r a much quicker way to get done what you want to get done. Whereas like the work is very political in the true sense of politics and that it's very logy and kind of loquacious. And I think that it often kind of undoes itself. And so I'm interested in like sharing these amazing archives or these fragments from gay history but I'm not interested in presenting them in this kind of linear or activisty kind of way where they need to kind of serve this really specific purpose or advance a cause. Like, in fact, I'm interested in kind of muddying that a little bit. Um, so I think that, you know, m my therapist said that the strongest emotion we have as humans is ambivalence. And I think that that's, that's always stuck with me. Um, because we always think about ambivalence as something that's weak, but it actually is about passion being pulled in two different or multiple directions. And so I think a lot about the idea of like how ambivalence, and I mentioned that several times tonight, kind of fits into the reception of this work. So on the one hand, yes, like I'm interested in sharing, but on the other hand, I don't have like an ulterior motive. Um, so, um, and I also don't necessarily need this to only be presented in front of a queer audience either. Like, I think that these issues that I address and this idea of ambivalence and identity construction affects anybody's identity. Like, I think this is a really contemporary condition. Um, like, both things are true. I think we're living in a world where both things are true. Oh, this is small. I mean, it's huge on there, but like, it's like, it's larger than a jeans pocket, but it's like maybe like 12 inches tall. Like it's not, it's not huge. Thanks so much, everyone.